you know, your first, your first Ironman is always such an experiment and, and, and experience at the same time that I think the best way to do it is, is not to have any, uh, outcome goals at all. I mean, I, I don't race that way anyway, but, um, it's more about just like the cliche one foot in front of the other and just focus on the task at hand. Welcome to the I Race Like a Girl podcast, where a professional triathlete and an age grouper talk all things sport and life. We are here to educate and enlighten, but most importantly, to keep it real. We are your hosts, Amy Woods and Angela Nate. Let's race to it. Hey everyone, it's Amy. This podcast was so fun to record. Angela and I share stories from our first Ironman experiences while also giving tips and tricks for those heading into their first or fourth or 14th Ironman. From flat tires to fueling issues to being naked under a wetsuit, the theme of this podcast is be prepared for anything and everything to happen over the course of 140.6 miles. It doesn't matter if you are an age grouper or a pro. I think you're going to get a lot out of this one. Enjoy! All right, we are back. Hey, Angela, how's it going? Good, good. Very happy to be here. (laughs) Yeah, so today we thought we would talk about our first Ironman experiences. Mine is pretty fresh in my mind because I just did my first full a couple months ago, and I cannot wait to hear, Angela, about your first full ever. So Mm -hmm. we are just going to jump right into it, and I'm going to have you start by talking about when your first full was and where it was. Yeah, I so when I first started triathlon, I always thought, you know, an Ironman, no way could I do that. That's full marathon at the end. I've never run more than a half marathon, and I thought that was really long. Um, but there came a point in my career that I, I, I got really intrigued. And so it was probably four years into racing pro. And my first one was in Ironman Lake Tahoe. So that one actually got canceled over the years because it is pretty, pretty epic in many different ways. Uh, It was a very hard course. It went up and down and uh, the weather change, the weather changes there are dramatic. So that's kind of what happened with me is I went there two weeks early and slowly it just dropped in temperatures. Um, And just a quick story on, on, on my first one, and then we can start kind of going into the details is, so it started to drop in temperature two days before it was going to snow. And uh, we had to put all our, our clothes and bags and T1 stuff all in a bag outside in a parking lot. And so it started to rain and then snow. And so my whole thought process is all my gear is going to be wet. I don't want to do this. So the night before the race, I went down there and (laughs) grabbed my stuff, brought it back home. And then in the middle of the night, it dawned on me. I'm like, well, I'm, it's going to be freezing. It's going to be probably 32 Fahrenheit and we have to swim. So I thought, well, what if I don't wear my kit under my wetsuit? Cause then when I get out, I will have a nice fresh (laughs) dry kit. Um, Little did I know, which I should have known as anyone that wears Lycra or spandex or anything is it extremely hard to put on when you are damp in any type of regard. So after I did the swim, my feet and hands were completely numb because of the temperatures. I'm in transition and I bundled my bag with probably 10 jackets because I don't like being cold, 10 jackets, like all sorts of things. Meanwhile, I could not get my wetsuit off and underneath the wetsuit, I have nothing on. I'm completely (laughs) naked. (laughs) I went from like being third out of the water to spending 20 minutes in transition. I had four people help me get my wetsuit off. I'm standing there naked. (laughs) I'm trying to put my kid on. And I can't because my, my whole body's wet. And so that first experience was, uh, was an experience, but I mean, there's so much more to it, but that's kind of, kind of the worst part of it. (laughs) I just have so many questions, including being, I mean, the biggest question is like, what possess just being naked underneath your wetsuit (laughs) and, and, um, wondering if, anybody has ever done that before (laughs) because you know I I, yeah I just can't imagine but I imagine I know the thought process behind it because you don't you're coming out (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, it is genius. And I also, so let me ask you this, the four people helping you with your wetsuit, were they like, oh, you, you don't have a kit on or anything? Did yeah, they say like, anything? Do you remember? No, they didn't, but it is not genius. It is the most stupidest thing you could have done. And I just wasn't, I, I just thought I do not want to be cold. And so I guess that's where the, the moral of this story goes. It's like, you can get so stuck on one fear that you don't see the whole process. And so my fear was being cold. And uh, in the meanwhile, I spent 20 minutes in transition, lost all this time and had to figure it all out after. So um, yeah, I, I don't know if anyone else has actually done that, um, but I highly not recommend it at all. <laughs> so. I feel like if anybody's listening to this, anybody has done that, I absolutely <laughs> want them to email us because I need to hear about yes. this. Um, if it, you know, so maybe it's not a pro tip, but <laughs> maybe it <Yeah>. is. <laughs> but you know, what's really funny is when you said you were afraid of getting cold, I hate being cold as well, mm -hmm. but in my first Ironman and in all of my races, one of my biggest fears was getting a flat. And so mm. I, you know, had raced a bunch of Olympic sprints and 70.3s and I had not gotten a flat. And so I run two bliss on my tri bike and did not have a problem with it at all. And when I got to transition, I did Ironman Arizona this past year and I got to transition at 515 in the morning and it was dark and I felt my front tire was a little low. And I was like, okay, that's weird. So I spun it and I could see the sealant coming out. And I was like, oh, oh no, oh no. So my biggest fear in my race was happening before my race even started. And luckily my husband was racing with me. My husband is a bike mechanic among other things. And so we tried to Dyna plug it, which you put this little dart in and, you know, and it plugs up and we pumped it up. And we went and I said, okay, let's drop our bags at, you know, special needs and all of that. And we'll come back. And I am dying on the inside and trying to be super brave on the outside. And we come back and it's not, it's not sealing. You can see the sealant still coming out. So we take it to the bike mechanic and he ends up taking the tire off, running his hand through, you know, around it, checking everything and putting a tube in. And then we put, you know, blowing it up and putting the tire back on the bike. And I have more to this story, but, you know, <laughs> getting the flat before at 530 in the morning was our, so I already had started my race. It didn't even start my race yet, but it was super stressful before I even got my wetsuit on. The bike mechanic guy was super nice. Uh, I will admit that I did cry <laughs> when he was blowing up my tire, when we finally decided to put the tube in. And I was like, okay, I have a tube. It's totally fine. I started to cry kind of out of relief. Okay, that was over and done with. And when we get to the race mm -hmm. later, it was not over and done with. But, you know, the fear of getting a flat now was like in my mind. And that's something I had to push out of my mind and focus on just the race and the swim and all of that. So it's funny how sometimes our biggest fears, um, you know, become real in your head. <laughs> you have to deal with it. Yeah, you deal with it. When you had the flat, like, because I've never really had a flat pre pre race, but that's always been a big fear of mine is having stuff wrong with with my tires and wheels and everything like that. So I know how I would react even after all these years of racing. It's the worst feeling in the world because it basically stops you from being able to ride um, and it takes time to fix. And so like, what was your initial reaction? Cause, cause to me, I, I would be like, Oh shit. <laughs> and like, like fix mode would come into play and I would try my best. But I mean that like all those different type of stressors that come, they, they play a role in the race because it's a lot of energy you're out taking. And um, yeah, I mean, did you go to your husband right away or oh, yeah. like, how did it, how did you, <laughs> my, <laughs> like, yeah, no. <laughs> my initial reaction was, was crap. I shouldn't have done the 20 minute shakeout ride the day before. <laughs> and I, in my, the back of my mind, I was like, this is why you can probably attest to this and maybe you use it or not. This is why pros bring their trainers. 
Now I flew cross country. I wasn't going to fly with a trainer. I'm not a pro. That's silly for me. But I was like, now I see why people ride their trainers because I was kicking myself. Um, And then my next thought, I have, I have my phone with me and I'm trying to call my husband who wasn't racked near me. And I was like, you have to get here. Mm. He was super calm about it. I mean, I was pretty calm. I did know in the back of my mind that we could put a tube in and that was fine. But when you have a mechanical like that, like, I just didn't know what caused it. You know, was there something structural with the tire? Obviously it was a pinprick. You could see the sealant coming out. So it wasn't that it wasn't seated right or anything like that. So yeah, I was, you know, and the guy, God bless him. There was a guy next to me who we borrowed the pump and he was like, oh, you're running tubeless. <laughs> you shouldn't run well, tubeless. I, well, yeah. <laughs> I have to say, so that was one thing I was going to say to our listeners. This may, you may not know what a tubeless tire is, but basically it's a tire without a tube in it and it seals itself along the rim. And a tubeless tire can turn into a tube, tubed tire um, if you need to. And so that's basically what, what, what Amy did. Um, oh no, no, you put the you put a dart in, right? You didn't put a, a the first thing tire. we tried just yeah. just my husband and I is putting the dart in, yeah. and that usually that can usually work because you you start riding and the tire seals itself, um, and it works yeah. very well. Um, I had like I said, I had not had any problems with my tubeless tires until of course race day because that's Murphy's law. Yeah. Um, and then when we saw it wasn't sealing because I wasn't riding on it, I just I was like, let's just put a tube in. I'm done. We're putting the tube in the front. You yeah. know, I'll run one yeah. tubeless and one tubed. And then honestly, I, after I cried, because I'm not, you know, I just pushed it out of my mind. <laughs> we all cry at times. <laughs> we all cry. We cried during the race. <laughs> um, so I I just pushed it out of my mind. And I, I have to, I did yeah. not, the only time I thought about it between, you know, I lined up for the swim is when I was coming out of the swim and I was like, I'm going to feel my tire <laughs> before I take off. And, um, and it was Mm -hmm. fine, but there is a part two that we'll get to, but at that point it was fine. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And just a note on tubeless tires. I love tubeless tires and they are the way to go. So the guy that was next to you, disregard what he says, if you're comfortable with tubeless tires, which, um, honestly, I feel they're way better than having a tube tire, um, because it allows you to have the sealant. And then if something does happen, you carry a, a, a spare tube and it's easy to fix. You can go right into um, a tube tire. So, uh, you, you kind of get the best of both worlds. So, um, it is something to look into, uh, cause they are the way. <laughs> so this, I want to go back to your race too, because it was your mm-hmm. first full Ironman as a pro. So you had never done a full as an age grouper no. and you had, you, you have a mass start, you tread water. What, what, what month yeah. was this? When were you in Tahoe? <laughs> uh, this was in September. Yeah. Okay. So pretty right. much where temperatures do drop. So they ended right. up actually uh, stopping the race because the one year there was a bunch of fires. That was the year after my year. It was freeze like it was snowing. It was below zero. Or sorry, I'm Canadian, so I think yeah. zero. Um, <laughs> it was below 32 Fahrenheit. Um, so yeah, it doesn't exist anymore. But uh, the time, the timing of it was just hard to do. So, so when you and because you still have mass starts as a, uh, I've never done yes. a mass start because when I started long course try, yeah. it was all, you know, five at a time you line up at your time. So I've never, I don't know what the mass start feels like. So, and terrible. this is not just for, t- <laughs> it's terrible. So when you, you're treading water, do you, this is what I want to know. This is why, this is why we're here. Um, do you talk to each other in the water when you're treading water? Yeah. You do? Okay. Yeah. So, um, well, like over the years, you get to know certain people. Yeah. And so you try to make jokes and, you know, there are some very serious people on that start line. And it's just, yeah. like, <laughs> I mean, I'm more of a joker. And if I can talk to someone and just have fun with it, it's great. And um, Michelle Vesterby, I love her. Like we've done Cozumel a few times and we just shoot the shit. <laughs> it's just so <laughs> much fun at the start of the race because we just have fun with it. Um, but then there's others who are just very stoic and like, put on this game face. And I mean, everybody's different. So it's just how you react to your emotions and get into the game of the race. But as soon as the gun goes off, all those kind of things just go away. So, but it is very frantic and I'm personally not very strong at that, but I've all over the years have tried to develop it. 
you just have to kind of let go of all that like anxiety and just it's almost like an aggression you have to have or you're just going to get beat up or thrown out the back which I usually do get thrown out the back because I'm not <laughs> as a strong swimmer as everyone else but I try <laughs> yeah so that, 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 that's the key for sure and so that must have been if Tahoe in September was cold the water must have been cold because you were cold coming out um but you remember yeah. Did, were you cold? Do you remember? Were you cold in the swim? Because this is your first 2.4 mile swim in a race. So are you, Yeah. I don't know if you remember if you were in the pack or were you behind or, and were you uh, thinking to yourself, wow, this is kind of long. <laughs> yeah. It, well, it was a two loop course and you actually oh. couldn't really see the next buoy in front of you because it was completely foggy. The water itself was probably in the seventies, like just below there but the air temps were really, really cold. So prior to the race, I actually put plastic bags on my feet because they were freezing on, on the ground. Like it, it was so cold. Um, so I, so I wasn't cold swimming, but as soon as you got out and had that air on you, that's when you got really, really cold. And so I was with a bunch of people. Um, I mean, there was only about 20 of us racing, I believe. And then, then once we got to the second lap, there's just people everywhere. And so, um, you kind of just followed the crowds because you honestly couldn't see where the next buoy was. It was just foggy. <laughs> it was very weird. <laughs> very and what's that difference. like in a two loop swim? What's that like for a pro to have to swim through? Uh, we'll, slower, we'll call them age groupers like me. What, uh, what's, is that, is it, an, I don't want to say is it annoying because it's just part of the race, but I assume, do you have a tactic for that, for trying to swim through or just kind of um, zigzag? Yeah, I mean, it happened again in Lake Placid this past year when I did the swim bike there. Um, it's a two-loop course, and you you get caught up with all the different packs. Uh, you really want to try to find the simple tangent from line to line, but people like to follow the buoys. And so I made the mistake in Placid to go really, really wide and extended my swim, where really I should have just cut in tight and just try to, like, pass it through as I could. Um, it is difficult. I mean, I mean, there's a lot of sighting involved. You you bump into a lot of people but again it's it's it is what it is you know you don't get to choose how the race is, is done you just have to you you have to do your best and so yeah, yeah. I've I've bumped into a lot of different people at times <laughs> yeah and then I don't do the races where you jump in with two people or you know every call in so how is that because I I personally would find that a little nice in a way but then also very difficult because you don't really know where you are the entire race. I mean, that's, that's a whole yeah, different game to me. It is. I mean, I have done mass starts in our smaller local races pre COVID because you would just go off with your age group and uh, I would just line up to the back and left, <laughs> which is fine. So I, I mean, I love the staggered start every five people it takes a little bit, you're standing there, but they do a pretty good job of moving it through. So I was standing the morning, you know, I was walking, we walked to the swim start. This is Arizona in Tempe Town Lake. Um, and also what's funny about the temperature dropping is the day I got to Tempe, the, or the water temp was 67, which is almost unheard of for Tempe Town Lake in November. Mm -hmm. I was prepared for like 60 degrees, not happy about it. Um, and I was like, this is going to be fantastic. And then by the time we had the practice swim and then it, then the actual race, it had dropped like three or four degrees in three days. So the swim was 63, which wow. is fairly cold. And I did get cold. So I'm waiting in the swim start. And I, I like to talk to people as well. So we were talking and I lined <laughs> up. Actually, I lined up pretty accurate to what I was going to do for my first Ironman. I am not a strong swimmer. I'm just kind of a workhorse. I'm working on it. And so I got in, and Tempe Town Lake is notorious for its lack of visibility. People like that swim because it's very, very simple. It's a big, giant rectangle, and there's not a lot of natural current. There ended up being current and chop from all the people. Um, but it tech, it usually is a very calm swim compared to other swims. So mm -hmm. I will say that <laughs> I got cold. I got cold about halfway through the swim. Yeah. Um, I mean, I was in there, I was in there for an hour 30, you know, but the thing with Tempe town Lake with no visibility, it was wild. You could not see your hand in front of you. Mm -hmm. And 
and you couldn't see people around you. So you did not know you were near people until they bumped into you or you bumped into them. Hmm. And it wasn't, oh, wow. it, it was, it was crazy. I've never swam. I mean, I did the practice swim, but I've never swam in water where you couldn't see like that. Yeah. I think that's one thing for your first Ironman is to really be prepared for any type of water. I mean, I've been in Ironmans where I've felt the same way where three quarters in, I'm like in emergency mode, like I'm freezing and I need to get somewhere quick (laughs) because I don't think I'm going to make it. Um, A lot of the times I find if you double cap or use a neoprene cap, um, it's something that's really, really beneficial because if you keep your head warm, your, your whole body stays warm. And so out of all the things for the swim, I think knowing that the water temperatures that, that you're able to swim in and be feeling comfortable in are key. Um, I do remember when you were jumping into this race, you were jumping into your local lake at like 52 degrees or whatever it was. And I'm just like, Amy, <laughs> you need to stop. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because yes. really there's, there, there's not much more than you can add than a neoprene cap that, that that's really beneficial. If you put the gloves and booties on, I mean, yeah. It, it won't make that much of a difference. So it's either wear the neoprene cap, double cap it, or single cap. And if you know your temperatures that you can sustain, it's a really easy thing to fix. I did bring the booties and the neoprene cap. I, I swam in booties. They slowed me down tremendously. I yes. felt like I was even, and they fit. Um, so I knew right away I wasn't going to, once I really put them on, I was like, I'm not using booties. But I did double cap. And you know what else I would tell people to use is earplugs. Um, I actually usually oh, don't swim yeah, yeah. in earplugs in the pond, in my pond here, but I swam in earplugs in the practice swim when it was cold. And I did a couple, it, the earplugs very much help. Yeah. I think, I think like the overall theme here for the swim is you just have to kind of let yourself be open to what could be and prepare yourself as best as possible. I mean, that's, that's the nature of Ironman itself is you can prepare yourself so much, but also know that anything bad can happen and um uh you have to just know how to react to it it's the way that you react it and solve problems i remember i think i can't remember it was my first coach or second coach but he was saying iron man is just solving problems and that's all it is because things will automatically come up no matter what it is nutrition bike mechanicals uh, uh blisters uh gi issues all that kind of stuff so knowing how to react to it and fix it and hopefully change it for the better uh, will get you to the finish line the best. (laughs) So we got through the swim. You spent 20 minutes in transition. (laughs) Do you eat anything? Yeah, well, that was the other thing too, is knowing the temperature. So back then I uh, had a lot of power bars. So it was freezing. So my power bars were so, they were rock hard and I couldn't even eat them. (laughs) So... (laughs) My whole nutrition plan that I had kind of went out the window. Um, back then, I didn't really know much about nutrition at all. I just knew I had to eat something. Um, so I've learned a lot over the years. But for that first one, I I had power bars that were extremely hard at the time because it was freezing. Um, so in retrospect, I would have went completely to gels. Um, and, you know, I don't know of any other Ironman that has been that cold before. So maybe this for Sireman isn't a big, good example, but the one example is just like, again, being prepared for anything that could happen and and looking at the different temperatures and, and, and just working with what you know will work in certain temps. Like uh, when it's extremely hot, I find it really, really hard to eat solid foods. And so I changed the way that I have my nutrition plan to more gels and and stuff that is more fluid based and drink in a lot more sports drink versus non. Um, so there's just all these small things that you got to think about. Did you, um, so if your power bars were frozen, did you have backup stuff or did you pull from the course? (laughs) I had to pull from the course. Yeah. It was, uh, it was a hard race because I, I just didn't fuel as well as I could have. And I didn't have the knowledge. Um, and that really kind of sets up the run, uh, hard. Um, but I got through the bike, you know, and I had many, many layers on. And that's the one thing, if it is cold, I always suggest to all my athletes to wear extra layers. And if it gets warm, I mean, be prepared to throw that stuff at at, at an aid station. I mean, you won't get it back, but at least you start out warm. Um, because if you're already fighting 
being cold, that's a lot of energy in and of itself. And then you still have to ride 112 miles. So to me, it's better to be warm, get rid of stuff as you need to versus not having anything and trying to get to T2. Yeah. Do you ever wear gloves? I mean, I don't wear gloves in a race, yes. but did you have, <laughs> did you have, you do? Yeah. Um, yeah. Like that race, I had lobster gloves. I mean, it was freezing, but I've had races where I've put socks on my hands. Uh, there's a few mm-hmm. pictures of me wearing socks because <laughs> I, uh, they're cheap. I mean, I can just wear socks and I still have maneuverability and, and hand function and stuff. And they keep my hands really, really warm. Um, and then I can just throw those at the aid station and not be like, oh, I lost a pair of gloves, you know? Yeah. So I, I, I do that quite a bit. I did have a pair of arm warmers in my bike okay. bag that I ended up not putting on, but I was, um, I was prepared to just lose those for sure. Yeah, no, for sure. So, so in your race, you got on the bike cause I know everything that happened in your race. So tell us a little <laughs> bit about your bike and the whole scenario. <laughs> we go back to the tire. So I get out, I get out and, um, my T1 was weirdly long. I don't know what I think I was cold getting out of the water. So it did take me a little bit of time. Um, I checked my tire, I got on the bike and, you know, Arizona is in some ways a very beginner friendly course, beginner Ironman friendly, first Ironman friendly course, because it's not technical. So you don't have a lot of twists and turns. You don't have a ton of hills, you know, like, like a Wisconsin, which is beautiful, but a little more technical. It's kind of straight out and straight back. It's three, I I guess, loops, three out and backs. But as anybody who has done flatter courses, and Arizona's not flat, it's an incline up, a decline back, you can deal with wind. And so the first thing we realized, I was looking at the weather, of course, because you know, and I know that I'm obsessed with weather um, for a race. (laughs) But um, I think a lot of triathletes are. (laughs) I know. So, So it was windy. So we had a massive headwind on the way out. I mean, 18 miles of headwind. I looked down that first loop and the wind picked up as the day went on. And so I looked down on that first loop because it's an incline to the turnaround. And I was going 10 miles an hour. And I was like, this is fantastic. Oh, wow. Like this is going to be a long day. I do the turnaround and the road back, I start to like go fast because you have a tailwind, which was gorgeous. And I'm like, gosh, this road is really rough. And then I'm like, huh, this is like mile 19. I'm like, no, 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 this road is really rough. And I look down and my front tire is like wobbling and like the, t- it's flat. And mm. my first thought is, mm-hmm. no, and oh shit. And my second <laughs> thought is, where's my husband? <laughs> I look for, like, <laughs> out of t- what, yeah. 2000 athletes on the course. I'm looking for my husband <laughs> to come fix my flat. You know, I had a tube, I had a flat kit with me um, on the back of my bike. I had Mm -hmm. a flat kit. And so I'm like, okay, let's go. So I can do this. And I will tell everybody, I practiced changing a flat over and over. And I'm not saying obsessively, but I would say every couple weeks, every week or two, I would just do it. Sometimes not even on my tri bike. I would do it on my road bike. I would do it on a gravel bike, just trying to use the tools. So luckily it was the front tire, which is a little bit easier to get off. So I got the front tire off and I think I was like possessed. I don't know, because if you know me, I'm not super (laughs) mechanical. I took my tool out. I got the tire off. I pulled the tube out and then I started to run my hand inside the tire because you want to see you know, if it's a thorn or whatever. And I'm, I am having a minor panic attack while doing this because I was like, what is going on? Like, why did I get a flat? He replaced it. And then I feel something in the tire. And so if anybody knows, we talked about that thing called a Dynaplug. And when you Dynaplug something, there's a little tiny dart, like a metal dart that goes inside the tube. And when you're tubeless, I mean, in the tire, and when you're tubeless, you mm-hmm. leave that dart in, it can rattle around, it doesn't matter. Well, the bike mechanic, he left that dart in. So when he put Mm. the tube in, the dart punctured the tube. And so I had, you know, so I was like, what is this doing in here? Like, now I'm not a bike mechanic. So I did have a moment where I was like, wait, is this supposed to be in here? And, you know, and then I was like, no, this shouldn't be in here. So I used my fingernail and I pulled it out, put my spare tube in and kind of blew it up with my mouth a little bit to make sure it's seated. And then, of course... This is why, here's another tip. Always carry two CO2 cartridges 
because yes, I put the that fe- is a very good tip. I don't want to say it exploded, but I didn't have it on right. So it kind of released. And I was like, oh my God, because I had one. So I started yelling out as people are going, does anybody have an extra CO2? And within 15 seconds, somebody had thrown me one. I don't know who it was. And so I was able to put that on. I pumped up the tire. I let a little bit out because the CO2 can overinflate it. And then like a boss, I got that tire <laughs> back on the rim without a tool. It was like my hands. I was like, er, er, er. and I, cause I had practiced that. I watched my husband do it. So I put the tire back on and, um, and then I put it on the bike and then I had to shove the, you can't leave trash on the course. So I had to shove yeah. the the tube in my like tiny little tri pocket with the tube kind of hanging out. But I never really went to a dark place. That's not the way I race. I just was like, well, this Mm -hmm. is what it is. And I'm out here and stayed on my fueling and hydration plan the whole time because that is of utmost importance on the bike. As you know, Angela, and as you tell your athletes, Mm -hmm. is, you know, (laughs) you use the bike to fuel. I'm only like barely 5'1". I'm like 104 pounds. And I went through seven bottles on the bike in six and a half hours. So I think four water bottles and four or five, maybe five SOS. I use SOS and I went through seven bottles. That's a lot. And I was really happy with that. Yeah, no, for sure. You really want to like, that is exactly it. The more that you can fuel on the bike, the better you'll be off on the run. You know, one of my key things for Ironman and maybe not talked about too much, but as I like, I like to pee twice on the bike that really allows me to know that I am fully hydrated um, so that's something you might want to practice actually, if you're, if it's your first time Ironman, but a lot of people, they just don't fuel right. And then they say, Oh, I had a great bike, but my run sucked. Well, no, you had a terrible <laughs> bike because you didn't hydrate yeah. and fuel properly. That's why your run sucked. Um, you may have, and then also pacing, pacing is, I mean, pacing and nutrition on the bike are the two biggest things that you have control over. And if you can do those accurately to what your ability is then you're going to have a really good run. Um, You know, I've made many mistakes in nutrition and it's why I changed coaches over the years to someone who really knew what they were doing and also just learning about what my body could handle. But I train and race and fuel the same all the time. And that's really how you practice getting in enough calories and carbohydrates, salts and fluids all at once. And so that when it does come on race day, as the golden rule is, don't do anything new you, you practice this day in and day out. And so dialing that nutrition is, is, is key. And then the pacing of course, um, is something obviously throughout your training and process of going into that Ironman, you should know internally either by perceived effort or heart rate or power, what you're able to sustain throughout that time. Um, and that just comes with practice and training and a good coach or a good knowledge base of what you can and can't do. And people feel differently depending on what they can handle. So it's really important to either work, you know, to think about what you can do because I don't use liquid nutrition. Some people use liquid nutrition. Yeah. My plan on the bike, and I was working with a sports nutritionist because I, and we can talk about this in another podcast because I'm passionate about it. I was a chronic underfueler and I needed help. But my plan was to have bars and cliff shot blocks, save and a couple gels kind of alternate eating every 20 minutes. And when it came down to it, you know, I could barely get a bar down. I just it wasn't Mm. I just didn't couldn't eat it. I don't know. So I just stuck to blocks and gels. You know, you also have to be ready to adjust on the fly kind of like you had to when your bars were solid (laughs) and frozen. I peed three times on the bike. So I feel like that was a success. And if you have trouble peeing on the bike, I don't know about you, Angela, but my trick is you have to pee on a downhill when you're not pedaling. Yeah, I know. Either on a downhill or an uphill. Sometimes I stand and that's the only way that I can really do it. It's it's tough. It's definitely there you tough. Go. So let's jump into the run. So my first Ironman run, um, I mean, I didn't, I've never ran past 17 miles, I think at that time never done a marathon before. So it was really an unknown for me. And just like many, you get to about mile 18 or 19 and then (laughs) the rails fall off for a lot of us. And that's kind of what happened. I mean, I was doing really well and then I was not doing well. And so it was kind of getting through those, those miles. I remember, uh, my, 
fiance at the time. Yeah, he's my fiance. He started yelling at me at mile 19 and I just couldn't, I would just broke down because I was, <laughs> it's just not what I needed. I needed like, like a hug and encouragement versus get your, <laughs> get yeah. going. She's right up there, you know, because I was already at that mental state where, I mean, I just wanted to get to that finish line. So, you know, if it's your first marathon, it's, it's tough. You, you, you find this consistent pace and, um, it's a big unknown. And, and the, the best thought process that I can say is you just have to experience it. Um, and, and, and know that, you know, you can do more miles. A lot of the times when I tell my athletes, if it's their first, do not be afraid of walking aid stations. Even now I walk aid stations because the more that you're able to control your nutrition, control your pace and, and be patient with it, you'll get to that finish line versus like, oh, I'll skip this aid station because I feel good right now. Well, you're going to feel bad at some point. So why not prepare for that? And the more that you can fuel yourself and be consistent in pace, the better you'll be um, versus a little bit more sporadic. Were you, and I don't know if you have changed this since, were you running by heart rate, by pace, by RPE, or were you just, this is what I can do? Yeah, for my first one, I, you know, and I, I try to, I try to say this to many, it don't, don't complicate things. Um, I like to go like my first one was by perceived effort. I trained a lot by heart rate, but for the run itself, it was more just, you know, get to the finish line. So I kind of had an internal gauge of a seven out of 10 effort and just try to sustain that. Um, not everyone I would recommend that for because heart rate is really helpful just determining not to go out too fast or if it's a super hot race your heart rate will rise dramatically and that's just gonna derail your race as well so heart so if you can keep your heart rate low it's it's a good parameter to look at in terms of pacing as well so um but for my first i did just go by perceived effort but if i were to do my first again <laughs> uh, hindsight uh i would probably use my heart rate and just kind of look at that but uh, it was a cold race. I mean, it was just more of a get through it kind of day after that swim. So, <laughs> and did you use um did you use gels um when you on the run and um, take from? Do you remember? I did use gels. Yes. Uh, again, at that time, I didn't know much about nutrition, so I kind of just was taking it as I felt. Um, so again, I my personal first experience with an Ironman could have gone a lot better <laughs> if I would have taken some steps toward it. I just kind of threw myself in the ring and, and tried to see what happened. I, I don't think I was fully prepared as if I would be now or what, or mm -hmm. what I would try to tell someone to do. And I, I, I guess that's the nature of today's podcast is, is, you know, look at all these little details and you don't need to go crazy about it, but just be aware, like, like nutrition is a key point. Pacing is a key point. Like, how are you going to race? Like, like you're not going to just jump in, but have a plan, like have some type of mental, physical plan that you can kind of gauge your effort in and and get to the finish line with you, you can veer off that plan if needed because of some mechanicals or what have you but you actually have like a concrete map kind of like a guide that will help you get there true yep a b c d plan <laughs> yeah exactly so what happened on your run because this is i mean you come from a marathon background i mean you've done the distances so you come into this new race very differently than mine. Um, so you actually have probably quite a bit of confidence, I would assume that you can get to that finish line. Yeah, unlike a lot of people, I spend the whole triath every triathlon looking forward to the run. And some people do not. <laughs> so I'm just like, get me to the run. So I had run Boston five weeks previously. Um, that was the October, the only October Boston, hopefully there will ever be. So I had run Boston and had a nice recovery. We can talk about that in another podcast. So I had a, a lot of run training and, and, a, and a marathon experience, which is not, you don't, you really shouldn't be running a marathon in Ironman prep. You don't have to. Some people will put one in, in a long prep, you know, because they want to run a marathon, but it's not super advised. <laughs> Things can go wrong. Mm -hmm. But so I, um, I got off the bike. I started, I was supposed to start out staying in my steady zone and I did go out a little bit too fast, but of course I felt fantastic, but it wasn't crazy fast. I took a gel and some salt tabs every like three miles and water from the course. And then Arizona is a three loop run and it's a little zigzaggy. It's got a little bit of mm -hmm. elevation, 
nothing crazy. You run on a um, dirt trail for a little bit just by the reservoir. But I I was happy on the run. <laughs> and, and, you know, <laughs> I just felt really strong. Um, and then I felt really sick. <laughs> and then I felt really strong. Um, I, I feel like what they don't tell you about an Ironman marathon is that there are going to be, or maybe they do tell you, there are going to be moments where you're going to feel real yucky. Like I, some, I had low grade nausea here and there, mm-hmm. and then I would feel okay. I was supposed to, or the nutrition plan said to eat some solid food, like a little bit of a bar or something like that. And that was absolutely a no-go. Um, it was, mm. that was not going to happen. Um, as a runner, I, I did not want to walk and I, I walked through the aid stations and then I just kept going because I felt okay. Had I had a massive cramp or feeling really, really sick, I absolutely would have given myself permission to walk, but I didn't have to. And I felt, I felt strong. I ended up doing my marathon in 355, mm. uh, which was pretty good. I just was like, the faster I go, the faster I'm done. <laughs> so... <laughs> You know, your first your first Ironman is always such an experiment and, and and experience at the same time that I think the best way to do it is is not to have any uh, outcome goals at all. I mean, I, I don't race that way anyway, but um, it's more about just like the cliche, one foot in front of the other and just focus on the task at hand. Um, and you'll get to that finish line. I mean, we all can get there. It's just a matter of of making sure that we can manage what happens in between all that. So, I mean, it sounds like you did really, really well. I had absolutely no outcome goals for this. Everybody, everybody wants to know what, what's your goal for this? What's your, what do you want to finish in? And I'm like, I just want to finish, you know, even though we all want to do our best and, you know, you might have some times in the back of your head, um, you know, for personal bests or something, but I definitely just wanted, I just wanted to finish. And then when I, did cross the finish line. <laughs> I crossed it in, I think like 12, 14. And the first thing I thought, it's hilarious. You know, everybody's like usually so elated. I crossed the finish line and I was just like, what was that? I was like, that was crazy. The whole time I was <laughs> racing, I was like, this is the craziest thing to do. I remember <laughs> looking at my watch. I was on the run. Gosh, I wonder what time it is. I was like, I think it's like five o'clock. Yeah. I was like, I've been going since like <laughs> seven o'clock. This, I was like, who does this stuff? This is wild. So, um, yeah, it's just the funniest stuff. I don't even, I don't know. Do pros go through that? Are you like at, are you like halfway through the marathon being like, who does this stuff? <laughs> oh yeah. I think I'm, a, I'm there in the swim <laughs> <laughs> and the bike and the run. I mean, you go through so many ups and downs and I think that's one thing to to point on is things will get bad. I mean, that's what you need to prepare for is that things are going to have a downswing to them and then you'll get an upswing. And almost always that I've experienced, it has to do with nutrition. So when you were talking about how you were kind of having like a cramp and you you felt nauseous, a lot of the things that fix that is quite honestly, just some salt pills, like some salt. Um, I like to carry salt and just put some under my tongue. And sometimes that changes the feeling of being of feeling sick. Um, and yeah, I mean, I've had times where, you know, you get to mile 80 on the bike and it's just, I'm in this, this really deep low, I'm not going to make it. And so that's actually when I like to take a lot of caffeine is kind of get that double boost right there and and move forward from there. And it, it, it almost always helps. So just knowing that you're going to go up and down, up and down, up and down and and manage that. So, um, yeah, I was going to say as, as an age grouper, I I get a lot of energy from the people around me. And, you know, when it gets dark or on the bike, you know, people are so friendly out there on the course. People are so willing to walk with you or run with you, give you a word of encouragement. And that is what it's about. You're not out there by yourself. So what would be, and we can both say these, if you had to give three tips of advice, um, your three best tips of advice to someone who's doing their first Ironman, what would they be? Well, based on my experience, but always know how to fix a flat. Yeah. <laughs> That's number one. <laughs> Eat and drink on a schedule, no matter what. Make sure you've practiced it in training all the time. And 
smile and just have this attitude of gratitude when you're racing because there are people who Mm -hmm. want to be in your position, people who couldn't make it to the race you signed up for, people who, you know, are sick or anything, Um, attitude of gratitude the whole way. um, And that will get you through. What about you? Yeah, I think for me, uh, one would be mindset in terms of just see what you got, you know, don't don't go in there with any type of I need to do a 1030 Ironman or, you know, a specific time goal, because it's your first one. And plus, if you know me, I don't have ever have time goals. <laughs> and we can get into that next time. But uh, yeah, just go in with the fact that, you know, your goals to finish and to and to get to that finish line, you know, and however that happens. Uh, I mean, if you've done the work, you're going to be able to do it. Uh, secondly, I mean, you, you, you took my most important is the nutrition aspect. So my, so my next one would be pace the bike properly. Everyone who has a terrible run, I'm telling you, is it because they do a terrible job at pacing or nutrition? So if you can dial in what you can sustain and run off that, and that comes with uh, a good coach, good training process and a program, you'll be able to get off and run. And my third tip would be to use all the aid stations in the run don't skip any uh i think i think the run is where you can make or break a race as well and so you really want to be able to pace it well and one of the best ways to do that is actually use the aid stations that are almost every mile in every race hydrate reset yourself you know you can speed walk i've been known to get into an aid station speed walk for like 10 seconds and then get right back onto running um so it just kind of helps get from one mile to the next mile to the next mile. So. Yeah. You reminded me, I actually, I gave myself 20 steps, 20 steps at the, I said, you get 20 steps to walk through this aid station and then you have to keep going. And I stuck to that. So that's a, that's a great, great, great point. You know, this conversation almost makes me want to do another Ironman again. <laughs> Maybe I will find ah, Good. We're going to get you. I'm ready <laughs> to sign up for the next one. I mean, I knew I wanted to do it, but now that we're talking about it, I'm getting excited again. Well, this was awesome. Um, hopefully everybody got some really good tips. I learned a couple things from you. So that's fantastic. Yeah. And if there's more questions, uh, feel free to reach out to us. We'll be sure to uh, answer as many as we can. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening, and we hoped you enjoyed it. You can find us at amywoodsfitness.com and angelanath.com. We'd love to hear from you.